hello, welcome back. Last episode, we were talking about the Jesus Revolution movie, and right. we heard a few stories, which made us think about something else that has been going on a little more recently, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on this, the Asbury Revival, um, whether you think it's legit or not, that's yeah. what we want to talk about. Right. Um, well, I, I, I always go to the Word of God in, the, in these type of things. Let me preface that by saying, first of all, as when any of these kinds of things happen, people split up sides. There are those who, oh, praise God, it's just, you know, and then there are those who, oh, God doesn't do that anymore. So we're probably talking to an audience here that maybe has already chosen up a side what you think about that. I find that most of the people that are most critical are people that haven't been there. Uh, the loudest voices are those who sometimes are the least informed, but they're just uh, an observation mm -hmm. by long distance from something they've heard or seen on TV. And well, you know that's that's wrong. So I would kind of preface it with that. Always always be careful about that. But you go to God's word, and it's just: Is there precedent in God's word for revival? Nineveh, uh, the day of Pentecost. In fact. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who is one of my favorite, I think one of the most brilliant theological minds of the 20th century, and interestingly enough, I'll, I'll say the reform, the, the hardcore reform Calvinist camp, which I, I'm dear friends with many of them. I, I often jokingly say I'm maybe about a three-point Calvinist, but uh, they love Martin Lloyd-Jones. You'll hear his name quoted any seminary that's worth its salt is going to quote Martin Lloyd-Jones. You know, he's just a brilliant, and one of the things he's, he promotes is the idea that the spirit of revival and the spirit of uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit are one and the same. They're the same thing. And he makes a mm. strong, strong biblical case for that. Now, even when I say baptism of the Holy Spirit, somebody, oh, no, not that stuff. Well, he, he basically points out, and, I, and I, I find that I agree with him. There's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit when you're saved. Roman, in Romans, Paul writes, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, right. you don't belong to him. So you can't belong to Jesus, be one of his, and not have his Holy Spirit. So at salvation, his Holy Spirit comes to dwell. The Holy Spirit is the one that regenerates us. Then there's the filling of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians, where he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the actual Greek of that is, the best transliteration, would be being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not about a pouring upon, it's about a continual right. flow of the Spirit through our lives. But then there are also the references uh, to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about that as a subsequent or secondary work of the Holy Spirit. Makes a very, very sound biblical case for it. In Scripture, sometimes it talks about uh, that Jesus baptized, but the instrument was the Holy Spirit, but then there's other times when the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit did the work, and there's a differentiation there. We've talked about that before. We don't want to go too deep in the weeds there. But when you talk about revival, again, you go to the Word of God. Was there ever a pouring out of his spirit? Certainly the day of Pentecost mm -hmm. and subsequent issues. Mm -hmm. So there's biblical precedent. So to, to come to a conclusion that God can't or won't do what he obviously has done historically in the biblical accounts, uh, I always, I kind of pick on some of my quote highly reformed brothers and sisters who are real, real big on the sovereignty of God. I am too. He's mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. sovereign. He yeah. is who he is and he does what he does. But those that are so, uh, and I'll put it that way, so big on the sovereignty of God are often the first ones who will say what he doesn't do or can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't have it both ways. If he's absolutely sovereign, he can do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and he's also proven that he already does these things. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. That's not taking those verses out of context at all. Then when he does things now that would seem to be akin to things he's done before, why do we write him off now? Oh, he doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. Those things ended with the apostolic age. Yeah. I always love that. There was one, we talked about this, there was uh, one well-known theologian who wrote a rather lengthy piece concerning the Asbury revival, and he talked about revival in general, and basically his his uh, summation was, revival is not a term in the New Testament. Yeah. Therefore. Therefore. Yeah. Well, apostolic age is not a term in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. If you can apply that logic to it, then you can't go to the term apostolic age. And I believe in the apostolic age. I think that's a valid term from uh, roughly the day of Pentecost, 30 to 33, to uh, John's death, uh, AD 100. That was the time of the apostles. Mm -hmm. I personally don't believe there are 
apostles anymore. There are those, I believe, with an apostolic style ministry and being sent out or send out others. But the qualifications biblically of, a, of a, an apostle to have been an eyewitness to the risen Christ, to have been directly called by him, mm -hmm. the signs and wonders, the miracles, uh, I don't think there are those who today can say, he personally directly called me by his spirit, he calls. But I mean, yes. in New Testament understanding of that, it was a, a literal confrontation. That, that's debatable, and I, I, don't, I don't argue that point with those who, oh yes, there are still apostles. But I, I don't think there can be apostles today in the same regard as there were apostles then, because we can't meet the same criteria. It's not possible. Uh, but that's, that's a story for another time. Um, but this rather lengthy piece that, you know, will that end with the apostolic age. There's a great danger in, as we say, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. Okay, the apostolic age was, yes, a definite chronological period of time. And what the Holy Spirit did in that time is well documented. The, the tragedy is when we say the apostolic age ended here, there's a whole crowd of people who say, and so did all the things that the Holy Spirit was doing right. in that time. I just think that's biblically wrong. I think it's biblically shallow. So as that relates to revival, if God poured out his spirit, if he moved upon men as he did in the New Testament, why can he or would not he do that now? We certainly have many historical, uh, the Welsh revivals of roughly 1904, 1905, and then another one, 1959, uh, revival in the Congo, revival in Korea, revival in the northeast of our country during the Finney days. I mean, there's a history. Yes. And when you want to go back to the early reformers of Zwingli and Luther and Calvin, how could you, I mean, I think the best title or name to put on that was happening was revival. What a mm -hmm. tremendous mm -hmm. revival transformation uh, that the Holy Spirit was moving to yeah. teach us about grace and get away from uh, what the established uh, Catholic Church ideas were. Uh, then you move on to Whitfield and Wesley and Moody and uh, Jonathan Edwards. One of the criticisms I heard a lot about the Asbury Revival, number one, I wasn't there, so I don't know. Yeah. But I did see and was aware that there were several hundred and eventually maybe several thousand young people who spent a couple of weeks praying, singing, singing praises to God, and people criticized that. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, they could be out in Antifa yeah. bombing things. They could yeah. be out doing violence we see on the news every night what young people are doing i'm sort of glad in fact i'm yeah. really glad that there's a bunch yeah. of kids who just want to praise the lord but here <clears throat> here was one of the criticisms well there was no preaching of the word now i don't know that they know that for a fact because right. in some of my study there were some times of preaching and looking into the word there have been great revivals that have started just from prayer yeah. in fact yes i would venture to say in my understanding most of the great revivals start because somebody or some group was praying, praying, mm -hmm. praying for revival, and God mm -hmm. sovereignly moved upon a, a group, a church, a city, a whole country yeah. in response to those prayers. Now, just as with a person that's being revived, if a person is being revived, one of the first things they're gonna need at some point soon is nourishment. Yeah. Well, same with the revival, a spiritual revival. There by necessity must be the teaching and preaching of the word to get spiritual yes. nourishment. But to say it can't be a revival because someone didn't preach a sermon, right. well, then you have to wipe out a lot of revivals that have been pretty well historically documented, uh, or they're just making stuff up, but it, we don't come to that conclusion logically. So I would say this, if, if ever there was a time when we needed a revival, yeah. spiritual revival, in our churches, in our country, in the world, yeah. it certainly is now. So. I just I can't see anything that prohibits us from praying for that, asking for that, expecting that. Right. But then, yes, if, if God should move in, in some sovereign, special uh, way to where we're just enraptured with his presence, we don't care about anything else, we just lay everything else aside, and we spend time in the Lord. A revival can start from preaching. Jonathan Edwards sure. in 1741 preached a couple places. Uh, the sermon was uh, sinners in the hands of yes. an angry God and what, what they now refer to as the first great awakening ensued. So you have evidence of examples of preaching of the word, God moved, revival started. But you also have uh, evidences of hungry hearts praying, seeking God, humbly interceding, and yeah. God moved upon them. But then there was preaching of the word. 
Have there been false revivals? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any revival where things happen that have no biblical precedent, run from it like the plague. Yeah. I mean, that's, oh, but you weren't there. You don't know what it is. No, I don't have to be there. Yeah. All I need is the Word of God. Yeah. And, and some of the zany, crazy, non-biblical, uh, have no uh, standing in Scripture at all, and yet people just want, well, but, but I, I felt the Lord. Yeah. can't be about what you felt. It has to be what right. the Word of God says. Yeah. The Word of God has established precedent. It's the same. Anybody that would stand up and say, oh, the Lord told me. The Lord's never going to tell anybody that can't, first of all, be backed up in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that God impresses upon people. I'm not uh, the least bit uncomfortable to say that all the songs I've written, God has given. Mm -hmm. But He's given in different ways. Sure. Sometimes I got up and I just thought, oh, I'm going to write a song today. But that was still the Lord that put that ability or gifting within me. But there are other times, like Rise Again, I Saw the Lord, and Tell Everyone, those three songs, where it was just like taking dictation. I didn't hear a voice out of heaven, mm -hmm. but I don't feel the least bit uncomfortable saying, this is the best way I can express it. God wrote the song, I just delivered the message. Didn't come out of my head. Yep. It wasn't, yep. I'm not that smart. So God, God can move in ways that I, I, I fear we just don't allow for Him anymore. Yeah. And again, because it's we don't, we don't study the Word. We don't get a sense of, well, what has God ever done? Mm -hmm. If He's ever done it, can He do it now? Might He do it now? Oh, no, God doesn't do that anymore. Well, but you said He was a sovereign God. He can do anything He wants, yeah. however He wants. He'll never violate Scripture, never violate His Word, but I, I would rather open the door to what God might want to do than close the door and say, no, I just don't think you do right. that anymore. Right. I think that's a dangerous well, thing. So sad. praise God for yeah. revival for young people who uh, they're moved upon, I believe, by the Spirit of God. Yeah. And if they want to sing and pray for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever, yeah. eventually there's got to be teaching and preaching and nourishment. And there will be if it's of God. Yeah. It's one of the ways you can tell a real revival from a false one. If it doesn't, at some point, either in the beginning or shortly thereafter, move and center on the Word of God, just back away from it, yeah. because then it's going to be man and emotion and manipulation. Right. Uh, but if it moves to the Word of God and that becomes the focus of it for direction, man, jump in with both feet. Which is, what I think, why um, God doesn't move in the same exact way every time, or we would make a formula of it. And, <laughs> well, here's what exactly. we do, and then this is going to happen. And. And we've seen that happen even in your life, you being my daughter, so less years on earth than me, but you've seen, quote, so-called revivals, and, and only God knows for mm -hmm. sure. But people come and they want to franchise it. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, oh, if I go there and get right. get some take of that, and I'll take my it. People. Yeah. And I'm not saying that God can't move upon a heart in a setting where he's moving in a sovereign, unique way, and you might take that passion or that excitement or but right. we've seen it happen where oh this is what it looks like here's what you yeah. got to do yeah I remember one revival and I, and I won't say which but one that I attended several times and I, I believe that it was initiated by the Spirit of God mm -hmm. the people were being saved and, and the word was being preached nightly but it seemed to me there was a transition where all of a sudden, you, you've got this kind of the old saying, we've created a monster that we got to feed. You, yeah. It became the mechanics of, okay, you learn how to administrate a revival. Yeah. Here's how you schedule it. Here, what, there was no schedule initially. Yep. yep. But all of a sudden now, here's how we do it, and here's, we need you there and you there. And, and a lot of times it's with good intentions, but all of a sudden, I, I think sometimes the Holy Spirit kind of goes, I'm out of here. Yes, I'm not needed <laughs> yeah. anymore. Right. Well, and and the Asbury revival at this point has been ended. Right. But I even really appreciated how they did that. And it, and it seemed like they said, this is to the detriment of our community. Yeah. We can't handle the crowds that are coming. So lest you think, well, see, it's over. It wasn't of the Lord. It ended. Right. I don't know. We're not saying anything other than... We think that there was probably some wisdom. I think there was probably some oh, wisdom so, on yeah. their part that said, we can't handle this and sustain this. Right. And God did something. He awakened his people. He awakened these students. He has started something, but we can't keep it up like right. it's been going right. or it's going to turn into just a machine. And they didn't want it to do that. Well, and so, hopefully we've all had, I certainly have in my 50-some years of being a Christian, I've had 
I will say epiphanous moments. I've had awakenings. I've had aha moments as I've studied the Word of God. Or something happened, an interaction with a person. It can be any number of things, but I certainly have had moments in my Christian life that I would call awakenings. Mm -hmm. I would hope that I had some awakenings. Yes. uh, Because to not have an awakening means you've continued in some realm of sleep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I don't want to... So why, if, if we would all concede, I think, that there have been awakenings in our individual lives, why wouldn't or couldn't there be an awakening in a corporate setting, in a church, a community, or even a country? So I, you know, I I just, again, I think people, there are people out there who just look for things that God may be doing, and he may not be, but there's a critical attitude, let's just find everything wrong that we can with it. Uh, I'm not sure that's a biblical posture. In fact, I I know that it isn't because Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, love believes all things. If we really love our brothers and sisters, whether we agree with them doctrinally or theologically, but if they're a brother or sister in Christ, love believes all things. I believe the best. It's not my place to, unless it's violating scripture, unless it's obvious, blatantly, unprecedented in scripture, but I don't know. Let, let's believe the best. Let's yes. uh, pray for revival. Yes. There's no reason biblically that we shouldn't. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you for being with us today. See you again soon.